allow you to look at information literacy from using uh, debate as a possible format, and then I have a couple other speaking assignments that I'm going to give you handouts on to also do this. Now, these particular assignments that I have, and I'll pass those out, are from my colleagues that teach in high school. One of the first one is called The Great Debate, and Matt and I created this from Burlington High School. I also have the rubric he uses. And uh, anything that is aimed here at a high school can also be used for middle school and elementary school. You just have to change what the topics are that are more suitable for, and age appropriate for that particular student body. So uh, the examples then here are just got, uh, set to be flexible and to be used in the way that you think that you want to do. So I thought I would introduce this particular unit with a short clip that's lots of fun from the film uh, Clueless. And they are debating whether or not we should take refugees in from Haiti into the United States. Amber will take the composition. Cher will be pro. Cher, two minutes. So, okay. Like right now, for example, the Hadians need to come to America. But some people are all, what about the strain on our resources? But it's like, when I had this garden party for my father's birthday, right? I said RSVP because it was a sit-down dinner. But people came that like did not RSVP. So I was like totally bugging. I had to haul ass to the kitchen, redistribute the food, squish in extra place settings. But by the end of the day, it was like the more the merrier. And so if the government could just get to the kitchen, rearrange some things, we could certainly party with the Hadians. And in conclusion, may I please remind you that it does not say RSVP on the Statue of Liberty. Thank you very much. Uh, Amber, uh, reply. Mr. Hall, how can I answer that? The topic is Haiti, and she's talking about some little party. Hello, it was his 50th birthday. Whatever. If she doesn't do the assignment, I can't do mine. I have wife in high school trying to do debate. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, one clip uh, of comic strip from Peanuts I've always loved was one where Charlie Brown is watching Lucy get prepared for a debate. And Lucy has said, I'm preparing for my debate, I'm preparing my notes so that I'll be ready and on my index cards. And Charlie Brown, you know, looks down, and here are her notes. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Big deal. So what? And of course, drop dead. And yes. he looks, and he just shakes his head and goes, "I think you're ready." So to try to hopefully have the dates that are a little more meaningful than uh, you know whatever or drop dead. Uh, this particular activity, I think, kind of gives you some of the instructions about doing a debate unit. And you can do the, the beauty of this is you can do it with four students, two per team. You can do it one on one. And so if you end up with an odd number of students, you can then make it so that you may have one team against, uh, one person against another person. Uh, you can even do teams of three people if it works better and, and because of class time, that will work as well. So the format is very similar to what the format was that we, you saw today in uh, today's debate. But you essentially then are giving your students the due dates, the information that they have to gather. I mean, it's all laid out here. And it becomes a very, you know, I think relatively easy activity for them to do. Uh, and using class time, you can give them time to do research at the library. Usually I find it is easier to assign students a side so that they are preparing either the pro or the con. Um, some teachers have done it where they prepare both and then the, they do a, a coin flip to determine which side they will go. And so for the debate, they have to, for the classroom debate, they have to be prepared for both. So essentially, you can do it any way you want in terms of that. And a, you can show, again, an example of a debate. You could show the one today if you wanted to. One debate that I think is a very interesting one to show a clip from, but again, it, it's a little dicey at the high school level, but it really does get you at information literacy. 
And that has to do with the Bill Nye debate versus creationism. Uh, Ken Ham, I believe his name was. And again, I do not know how well that will play at the particular school that you happen to be in the school district. But it is, at least for a portion of that debate, you get at what is it that you need to do to prove to me what will support this particular resolution. And you get at the difference between like the idea of a fact versus a value. And again, the whole reliance on the Bible. A lot of people wouldn't necessarily accept the Bible, and then that becomes your value that this is a, a source that I think is very credible and believable versus the scientific, you know, no, it needs to be facts based on, on all of the factual information of, uh, of uh, evolution. So I'm going to show you a short clip from that to kind of just get you to see in terms of showing your students what a debate can look like. Seeing people in, in being indoctrinated to believe that creationists can't be scientists. There's experimental or observational science, as we call it. That's using the scientific method, observation, measurement, experiment, testing. All scientists, whether creationists or evolutionists, actually have the same observational or experimental science. Now, Mr. Ham and his followers have this remarkable view of a, a worldwide flood that somehow influenced everything that we observe in nature, a 500-foot wooden boat, eight zookeepers for 14,000 individual animals, every land plant in the world underwater for a full year. I ask us all, is that really reasonable? You'll hear a lot about the Grand Canyon, I imagine, also, which is a remarkable place, and it has fossils. And the fossils in the Grand Canyon are found in layers. There is not a single place in the Grand Canyon where the fossils of one type of animal cross over into the fossils of another. In other words, when there was a big flood on the earth, you would expect drowning animals to swim up to a higher level. Not any one of them did. If Bill Nye and I went to the Grand Canyon, we could agree that that's a Coconino sandstone in the Hermit Shale, and there's the boundary. They're sitting one on top of the other. We could agree on that, but we would disagree on how long it took to get there. But see, none of us saw the sandstone or the shale being laid down. There's a supposed 10 million year gap there but I don't see a gap, but that might be different to what Bill Nye would see. But, but see, there's a difference between what you actually observe directly and then your interpretation in regard to the past. We're, we're talking about the past when we weren't there. We didn't see those tree rings actually forming. We didn't see those layers being laid down. It's like the dating methods. You're assuming things in regard to the past uh, that aren't necessarily true. The fundamental thing we disagree on, Mr. Ham, is this nature of what you can prove to yourself. When people make assumptions, they're making assumptions based on previous experience. They're not coming out of whole cloth. I encourage you to explain to us why, why we should accept your word for it, that natural law changed just 4,000 years ago completely, and there's no record of it. Natural law hasn't changed. As I talked about, you know, we, I said we have the laws of logic, the uniformity of nature, and that only makes sense within a biblical worldview anyway of a creator God who set up those laws. And that's why we can do good experimental science because we assume those laws are true and they'll be, they'll be true uh, tomorrow. We build models based upon the Bible and those models are always subject to change. The fact of Noah's flood is not subject to change. The, the model of how the flood occurred is subject to change uh, because we, we observe in the, in the, in the current world and, and we're able to uh, come up with maybe different ways this could have happened or that could have happened and, and that's part of that scientific discovery. You cannot ever prove using uh, you, you know, the, the scientific method in the present, you can't prove the age of the earth. So you can never prove it's old. So there is no hypothetical. <laughs> what we want in science, science as practiced out on the outside, is an ability to predict. We want to have a natural law that is so obvious and clear, so well understood, that we can make predictions about what will happen. And the big thing I want from you, Mr. Ham, is can you come up with something that you can predict? Do you have a creation model that predicts something that will happen? So it gives you like a flavor to show if you show this to your students and then you can kind of deconstruct and talk with them about what does it need to, in terms of evidence and proof. And when we talk about even propositions of debate, we have what is called a proposition of fact, and it can be past, present, or future. And so you really can talk about 
what has happened in the past that we would accept as factual and what we would not accept as factual, depending on how you define terms and how what kind of criteria you use to make that evaluation. Uh, there are lots of examples of other debates out there that you can show, and uh, it can be, you know, again, getting students, if you have some sample debates from previous classrooms and class assignments, that's always good to show too, because a model really helps students see what is to be expected of them. Now, and then again, WHSFA has lots of information also available to you so you can see some debates and so forth. Many of the times, uh, the activities and things that we have in terms of debate, we have some really outstanding students and then they feel kind of like, oh my gosh, I can't do that. Like the students we saw today were pretty proficient in terms of debate and all of a sudden it's like, I can't do that, I'm not even gonna try. And so sometimes having students that are not necessarily as competent and as proficient can really have a good a good benefit because they say, oh, I can do that, I can do that well. And uh, being able to see fallacies in the arguments become an easier point for class discussion. Any questions on that in terms of debate and, and integrating that? And as I was suggesting, if you wanted to possibly participate and try to have an extra or co-curricular debate program, sometimes using a topic that might be at the debate tournament in your class becomes an easy way to recruit students, either for extra credit or something along that line because they've already done the work and what's a, a Saturday or Friday or whatever day we're going to do, I'll do that for the extra credit in terms of that. So, and again, yes, yes, in terms of the, the wonderful uh, debate example here in terms of the comic strip. Now, Let's say you want to integrate some other kinds of speaking assignments beyond debate that really do focus on information and information literacy. Another example, and this is from uh, Beth Planky, who is a high school speech and English teacher at Nina High School, and she does an assignment that's a, a group assignment, so it uh, is nice because you can get several students through in a particular uh, day, and it is on a famous speech that students have to select and then do an evaluation of that speech. So uh, there is a list out, out, out there of the 100 best American speeches in the country. And so what do you think is number one on the list? I agree. I have agreed, you're right. Oh, but there's lots of other speeches out there that uh, are very famous speeches, but often don't get the same level of recognition as I have a dream. For example, Reagan's speech on the Challenger and the eulogy that he did is a marvelous example of a great speech in terms of the audience. And so, as you can see from here, you have to do uh, some expectations in terms of reading the speech, so the students actually have to read the speech. They can locate and view an electronic copy. And they have to respond to some of the basic questions you've suggested here, write a summary, analyze the speech. But what this particular assignment really focuses on is understanding the context of the speech and the research involved in understanding a speech that's maybe 20 or 30 years old. So what was the date of delivery? What was the location? What were the audience members? Which will really change how the tone of the speech is. Uh, identify the speaker's background and clarify the general purpose, summarize the speech, and then um, analyze the speech. And they give all of this information in the presentation. They set up the, you know, this is where it was. They show a portion of the speech. Uh, one of the groups that I watched do it, they actually had FDR's uh, speech at one of the fireside chats, and they actually showed the radio, or uh, played the radio uh, version of that, so students could actually get and experience the historical nature of what was going on in the context of that uh, presentation. And then what she also focuses on a great deal is the language that was used so that students have to identify what language choices were made when it comes to parallelism or it comes to uh, literal and figurative languages that were used, creative languages, and talk about, highlight an example of a rhetorical question used in the speech, an example of parallelism, a simile or metaphor. So they're also getting at the language part of a presentation. So this can also be very good to incorporate in an English class if you're trying to teach 
some of the, the mechanisms in terms of both writing and speaking in terms of language uses and proper language uses. And then I have attached there the rubric that she uses. And the students usually have 15 to 20 minutes to do this group presentation. And they have to pay a portion of the speech. They have to talk about it. They have to go through all of the questions that are laid out here and present that. And it requires them to do some historical research on a speech that they just, you know, just didn't happen yesterday that they have to look at and kind of understand the time period. So it can really incorporate some historical elements that students may uh, be unaware of uh, when they start this project. The other thing that I would add, as many of you know, with any kind of group project, you probably want to have some kind of an evaluation of the group members' contributions. Some group members work well, you have a wonderful time, and others are, you want to throw a lot of the group members under the bus, you know, kind of thing. And so that becomes important. If you've got the social slacker who does nothing, uh, then, and sometimes I even, when I've done assignments that are groups, I allow them to say, if this person isn't doing it, you come to me, and if everybody's in agreement, they will be essentially kicked off the island and will have to come up with something else because otherwise it's too difficult to try to give a grade for somebody else's work. But this is another way of doing, again, historical information. A couple other assignments that are really nice, uh, those of you that are involved in forensics know uh, the assignment of Moments in History is a good one to do, where you give them a decade and then they have to find a topic that uh, they are willing and interested in, in doing. And the thing, I, a beauty of that particular assignment, not only are they doing some historical research, they have to get back into the archives and so forth, is that I don't get duplicate speeches if I have multiple sections and I want to give them multiple decades. So if you have two or three speech classes and you don't want to hear <laughs> the same topics over and over again, I can give them a decade of the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1980s, and I am going to get different topics. And especially at the university, where we end up having the fraternities have all of the copies of people's speeches. <laughs> oh, well, you have Neil here, do this one. I'm giving them a different decade each semester, so they can't plagiarize. And it really is kind of nice along that line if you've got a problem with that. And it forces them, again, to get in and do some archival research. Another example of one that's a lot of fun is their birthday speech. And that is the day that they were born. Mm. They have to pick something on that particular day that happened that they want to give a speech on. And it can't be that they went to the machine shed and pulled out the card on their birthday, all these things happened. I mean, you could start there. But you better find something else that is interesting uh, to do along that line. Um, I had a student uh, years ago, and he, uh, he was an older student, but he found out on the day that he was born, they introduced the brownie camera. Remember, many of you probably don't remember, but the little brownie camera. He thought that was so cool. And all of a sudden, for his speech, he started going to garage sales to pick up some brownie cameras. And then he started a whole collection. He was a weird student. But he started a whole collection of collecting brownie cameras just because of that particular speech assignment because he thought it was interesting. It happened on the day he was born. And so that was, became what he needed in order to be interested in, in that particular topic. So, and if you want to change it a little bit, they can be the birthday of their mother, father, grandfather, you know, you can change the dates, but it forces them to not be sitting there, well, what am I going to do my speech on, and getting the same, you know, speeches you've heard over and over again to, okay, you were born on October 30th in 1981, go and do the research there. At this point, it would probably be 2001, you know, <laughs> but it forces them that, okay, You've got a narrow focus here. Start doing the research you need to do to do this speech and find a topic that you might be interested in. And as we say in moments in history, very much, it doesn't have to be, in fact, it shouldn't be a great event kind of thing because, you know, I'm not going to be able to hear in 10 minutes or 5 minutes or whatever the time is all the reasons we were in the Vietnam War or we were in, you know, uh, the Korean War or whatever decade. It can be something like Tupperware and the introduction of Tupperware in the 1950s. Or it can be about uh, Nike and the shoes, or something that they can get kind of interested in. But it forces them to have to go back and do some historical research, which I think is, is key to being able to get them to evaluate information and have another aspect 
of integrating it into a curriculum in terms of information. Any questions on those? And then, um, and I will have, I've got the birthday speech instructions that I'll send to Adam and have him send it out to, to everybody, so you have that one as well. Uh, another aspect of debate, going back to that, that we've done, I mean, Christy talked about pop-up debates today, but we used to do the old-fashioned tag team debates, which were kind of fun, where you gave a resolution out there, and whoever volunteered to go first would get up and give an argument, and if you thought you could do a better job, or had a better argument to present, you could go up and take that person, they would sit down, and then you would present your position and your evidence, or better elaborate on the position that they were giving, and each person, you know, has to do it once, but you could go around in the class and get them up, and they're, you know, take teaming, and then if they thought, you know, they could do it a second time, they could get up and take the person as well. And uh, very fun kind of classroom activity you can do on a Friday when you're trying to, before homecoming, and you're trying to in, in, keep them engaged, and this can be kind of fun in terms of, and it doesn't have to be a super resolution of, you know, super significance. It can be that, you know, such and such high school should allow a senior skip day or something like that, and, you know, the pros and the cons of that, and present those arguments. Questions? I don't know, what time is it anyway? Uh, 10 after three. Okay, because I'm trying to do it so that Adam has time to wrap up and you guys have a chance to get on the road because I know uh, daylight, there's much less of it these days, you know, as you get out. So, any other questions or anything in terms of it? But a lot of these, again, there are all kinds, uh, and most of it is through collaboration of talking with someone. That's one thing uh, I was going to say as a benefit to some of these debate uh, tournaments that we have on a Saturday is a lot of teachers sit there and exchange great ideas and come away with, oh, I can do that. That's a great idea. And they get more, better teaching ideas and better ideas of, oh, I can try that. That's a creative idea. But just by sitting there, as you know, and getting a chance to talk to someone. And so the collaboration of uh, involved in education and having the actual opportunity to talk face to face to do some of these things and exchange that is really the beauty of, of conferences like this. And, as I said, going to debate tournaments sometimes you find out lots of different ideas of the way people are, are doing things.